so um, it, it's my pleasure to introduce Dimitris Rizopoulos, uh, Professor of Biostatistics. Um, I believe he originally comes from Athens, uh, but he's been at the Erasmus Medical Center in Rotterdam for many years. And his research focuses on joint models for longitudinal and time to event data with uh, various applications, uh, biomarker identification, precision medicine, precision screening, and active surveillance. And uh, he's also my boss in his capacity as editor for biostatistics, where I'm an uh, uh, associate editor. So, uh, so I, I need to behave myself, be polite. So uh, please, uh, Dimitris, you take over now. Yeah, thanks, uh, Sean, and thank uh, also for the for the invitation to give uh, the seminar. Uh, so as uh, Sean mentioned, so first of all, I, I hope everyone can hear me well. Uh, I heard from Sean that the sound was a little bit low, so I hope everyone can uh, can hear me well. So uh, if not, let me know and uh, we'll try something else. So, but uh, as Sean said, indeed, um, I have been working for uh, many years now in um, joint models for longitudinal and time to event data. Uh, and I always uh, try to find interesting applications uh, of them in various contexts. Uh, and fortunately enough, uh, I always uh, get uh, some new questions from my colleagues from the clinic or from internationally to, to, to motivate uh, doing some new research uh, in this field. And this is also one of um, uh, such example that motivated the research that I'm going to present you uh, today, which is using this type of models to estimate the causal effects for uh, salvage therapy uh, after a prostatectomy. And then this is a joint work with uh, Jeremy Taylor from the University of Michigan and a previous PhD student of mine, uh, Gregorios Papagiorgiou. So let me uh, start a little bit by uh, first uh, saying a few words about uh, the clinical motivation uh, and the data that we have. Uh, and after that, to introduce you to uh, the approach that we uh, developed in this work. Um, so what is the, the general setting in which um, our work applies is uh, prostate cancer patients uh, who have been uh, diagnosed uh, with the disease and have been treated with, uh, with surgery. So um, just to say a few words about that. So for many patients, um, having prostate cancer typically evolves very slowly over the years. Uh, and in, uh, thankfully, many of them will die from other causes than from prostate cancer. But uh, unfortunately, there are some uh, patients uh, for whom uh, the disease is more aggressive and for whom more um, active treatment is required. And this is the particular group in which we are focusing on here. So patients for whom it was required to remove uh, the prostate gland. So after this uh, surgery has taken place, um, uh, this surgery, first again to say, this is also good that for the majority of these patients, this surgery is successful. And, uh, and in the remainder of their lives, these patients uh, will not um, have any other problems of metastasis with cancer. But nonetheless, there is a subgroup of, of these patients after prostatectomy who remain at a high risk of metastasis. And for that reason, all people, uh, all the patients who have underwent uh, prostatectomy, they are closely monitored uh, after this procedure. And, and how they are monitored? Uh, they are monitored with um, a PSA uh, level. So the PSA is uh, the prostate-specific antigen, which is one of the most important biomarkers for prostate cancer. And they, uh, this is a blood value uh, that they take at frequent intervals. Um, now, as, as I just said, for the majority of the patients, um, removing the prostate gland will be uh, successful, and therefore their PSA will remain to zero or very close to zero. But there are a few patients uh, for whom the PSA will start increasing. And it's for these patients um, that the physicians are going to give a, what is called a salvat therapy. And, and this is a generic term that uh, includes uh, androgen deprivation therapy, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or combinations uh, of these. 
And this is uh, where our work uh, here focuses uh, on is in this uh, salvage therapy uh, decision, uh, in particular, uh, who should take it, uh, when to start, and uh, how good does it uh, work. Uh, and the reason for that is because there are some guidelines uh, of when salvage therapy is to be initiated, but um, uh, not, uh, they are not followed to, uh, to very much uh, detail, and there's a lot of uh, input from the uh, treating neurologists of when exactly um, salva therapy should be uh, initiated. And therefore, we will try um, with, the, uh, with the data that I'm going to introduce in a moment uh, to tackle uh, this question. So more specifically, uh, our research question is to, to quantify uh, the effect uh, of the salva therapy in reducing uh, the risk for metastasis uh, for these patients. Now, uh, let me say also, uh, let me introduce you also to the data. So um, we are using data from the University uh, of Michigan. Uh, these are about uh, 3,600 patients uh, who have been diagnosed with uh, localized CT1 or CT3 uh, cancer uh, and followed up from 1996 to 2013, um, aged between 14 and 84 years old. And uh, as I mentioned from the start of my talk, these are who received the prostatectomy. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, many uh, baseline covariates uh, for them available, like what was uh, the, pre the PSA before uh, the surgery, uh, the Gleason score, which is a score from the biopsy uh, of, the, of the cancer, the stage of the cancer, age, rate, gland volume, uh, and a few others. Uh, as, I also, as I mentioned uh, uh, a couple of slides earlier, so after this prostatectomy, these patients are followed up using the PSA levels. And here uh, I show you an example of four uh, patients from this, uh, from this cohort. Um, so on the x-axis, uh, sorry, uh, on the x-axis, uh, we have the follow-up time where zero is the time of the surgery. Uh, and on the y-axis, we have the logarithm of the PSA plus one. And we're taking the logarithm to make the PSA more, uh, to have a more symmetric-like uh, distribution. Um, as I said, the typical example is uh, actually this patient, 2308, uh, that has stable and uh, low PSA levels. Uh, so in a sense, this is a good patient for whom the physician will not need to do anything, just uh, monitor uh, this patient. But uh, there are uh, some patients in the other group who start showing increasing uh, PSA trajectories. So like the rest three that I have here as an example. And it's for these patients for whom the urologist will uh, consider uh, giving this uh, salva therapy. And um, this salva therapy uh, is uh, seen in this graph directly by this drop that you can observe in the PSA level. So you see this particular patient had only three measurements. This other patient has a few extra measurements, but you see uh, a sudden a drop uh, in the PSA uh, level. Uh, and this is an indication of uh, that the salva therapy uh, was given to this patient. So typically what do we expect is that when the salva therapy is given, indeed the PSA to drop, uh, it will drop to, if successfully, to zero. As we have seen here, this was not totally successful, so it did not drop to zero. Uh, and then um, will uh, evolve afterwards, and then it will increase again uh, if um, this patient has a higher risk of uh, metastasis. Um, just to mention here that, uh, of course, the salva therapy can be given multiple times uh, during the follow-up, but in the context of this uh, analysis, we consider only the first time a salva therapy uh, was given. And uh, so if we have patients receiving additional salva therapies in the future, this has been uh, excluded from this analysis, mainly because we have very few of them, uh, and it would be difficult uh, to really uh, model them, as you will see uh, later on. Okay, um, now returning to our um, research question, which was to uh, quantify the effect uh, of salva therapy, uh, and therefore by quantifying the effect of the salva therapy, we would like also to answer the question at which particular follow-up time should be given uh, to this patient. Of course, taking into account how the trajectory of PSA looks like for that particular patient. 
Um, so to, to answer uh, this question, we have some uh, challenges uh, in the data that uh, we are using from the University of Michigan. So first of all, um, this has not been a randomized clinical trial about salva therapy, a really an observational uh, cohort. Uh, and therefore, we have very strong uh, selection bias of who uh, took uh, this uh, salva therapy, because indeed, as I mentioned, um, in, in actually what we have, we have time varying uh, confounding, because as PSA starts increasing, then is when the urologist uh, will start uh, considering uh, given the salva therapies. Um, additionally, we have uh, what is often called ascertainment bias. So this refers to uh, the longitudinal outcomes so or the PSA, where uh, again, uh, if uh, the PSA starts increasing, the urologist may ask the patients to come more often for a PSA test. And therefore, for patients who have shown increasing trajectories of PSA, will have more PSA measurements compared to patients who are more stable. Uh, and um, another uh, complication challenge uh, from a methodological uh, point of view is that this uh, PSA uh, time varying confounder will be an endogenous uh, time varying confounder for our uh, primary end to point, which is the time to, to metastasis. Um, okay, so therefore, uh, in order to uh, proceed uh, and be able to uh, answer our research question uh, from this data set, we will need to make some assumptions, uh, which are um, more or less the standard assumptions that we need to make if we would like to interpret the effects that we are going to find in this data set as causal. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we have the consistency uh, assumption, uh, which says that the observed outcomes uh, equal the counterfactual outcomes for the actually assigned treatment. Um, and by counterfactual outcomes, I will introduce them in a moment. Here we mean what would have been the time to metastasis and what would have been the longitudinal PSA measurements if the opposite uh, treatment was given to this patient. So if the patient did not receive salvat, the counterfactual would be what would be the time to metastasis if he did receive salvat, uh, and the other way around for a patient who did receive salvat, so what would have been the outcome if he did not uh, receive salvat. Um, uh, we also make in the uh, assumption of sequential exchangeability, which states that uh, the counterfactual outcomes are independent of the assigned uh, salva therapy conditionally on the PSA history and the baseline covariates. And um, in our context, but also in general, in the causal inference context, that will be the key assumption that we will use to, uh, to derive this uh, causal effect. Uh, and finally, we also have the positivity assumption that states that each patient has a non-zero probability of receiving uh, a salva uh, therapy. Okay, so um, now to start uh, going a little bit more into a uh, notation and putting all this story a little bit more formally uh, uh, down. So um, let me describe of what uh, we want to do and what type of effects uh, we're looking to estimate. Um, so I'm going to consider a generic follow-up time, which I'm going to denote by T. And up to this, uh, generic time, I will have collected some measurements uh, for, for a patient, so some longitudinal PSA measurements. And I also assume that uh, salva therapy has not been given up to this time point, okay? So uh, the setting is um, that uh, the urologist uh, wants to decide if he would need to give salva therapy to that patient at that particular follow-up time T. So to, to make this a little bit more clear, I have here a, a figure to, uh, to explain that. So indeed, here I have an example of a patient. This is the generic follow-up time T. So here I took it at three years after the surgery. So we have these four measurements of, of PSA. And we see that the PSA starts increasing. And here is that the doctor wants to decide. So should the doctor gives salva to that patient, or should we wait and uh, continue monitoring this patient? Um, and how uh, we are going to uh, address that is by comparing the cumulative risk of metastasis in a medically relevant time interval. 
which uh, is going to be uh, this delta t uh, that I defined here. Okay, so I am at this particular for lap time t, and um, the urologist is interested in um, a cancer occurring within a med this medically relevant time interval, let's say within uh, two years. Okay, so from three to five, as I have here. And, and the equation is, um, um, the, the counterfactual question, the, the two regimes question. So um, what is the risk of metastasis if we wait and we don't uh, give uh, treatment in this interval? Okay, and what will be the risk of metastasis if we do give treatment at time T? And, and of course, something that I did not uh, mention earlier, uh, of course, uh, this is a considerate choice because all these treatments have some uh, important side effects. So therefore, uh, um, the doctor needs to weigh the side effects versus the benefit of, uh, of giving this treatment. Okay, so now um, with this uh, context in mind, so now I would like to uh, introduce a little bit more formally and more specifically um, what are potentially different uh, effects for salvat therapy that we could define uh, in this context? Uh, and uh, in particular, to answer which is specifically our target group. So here I'm introducing a little bit of notation. So TM will be the time to metastasis. Uh, we also have a competing risk. So people could die for other reasons. So this is the time to death. And this calligraphic age uh, denotes uh, a version of the PSA history of the longitudinal measurements up to this time point in. And here is where now I'm introducing the two uh, counterfactual uh, outcome variables. So I have uh, the metastasis uh, with a superscript uh, A. So if A is one means that salvage therapy was given at this generic follow-up time T, and if A is zero, it means that salvage was not given in this medically relevant time interval. So again, to say is like the decision also for the doctor is not that salvage therapy will not be given at all to this patient, but the, the, the question is that this, the salvage therapy will not be given in this medically relevant time interval, let's say of, of two years. Okay, so... Um, now, based on these uh, definitions, um, uh, what is uh, often um, defined uh, and uh, of interest also specifically in the causal inference uh, context is what is the, uh, the average treatment effect. Okay, so uh, which we call here the marginal salvage therapy effect. And effectively uh, what this um, uh, marginal uh, salva therapy effect is doing is averaging over all PSA histories. Okay, so um, uh, that will be here on blue. What will be the cumulative risk of metastasis uh, up to this medically, uh, within this medically relevant time interval, given that uh, we didn't have metastasis of death up to this time point T? Um, uh, if we give salva therapy, and here is if we do not give salva therapy, so on, on red. Um, now, this uh, uh, the question about this effect and the effect that we are going to introduce in the next uh, couple of slides is a bias variance trade off. Okay, so um, because here we're averaging over a bigger group of people, so we're averaging all the people who are at risk at this generic follow up time T this effect we have um, a relatively low variance, okay? So we can more accurately estimate it. However, on the other hand, we'll have more bias because um, this is of re uh, lesser relevance to the urologist because they really decide of who is going to get salva therapy for increasing PSA trajectory. So therefore, if I'm going to average over all the people also for whom the PSA is relatively stable and low, um, this is why we say that will be uh, of uh, lesser relevance. Now, what would be of uh, more uh, actual relevance to the urologist is if we define the salvage, uh, uh, the salvage therapy effect conditionally on the specific PSA history of the patient that the urologist has in front of him. Okay, so. For this patient that the urologist has in front of him, do you have some specific PSA values observed, uh, which is now this HIT, 
Okay, and therefore I would like to answer the question uh, in a sense of what is uh, the salva therapy effect if I compare, if I give salva therapy and if I don't give salva therapy, what would be the cumulative risk of metastasis um, uh, for, in a sense, this particular patient? Um, actually, it's not this particular patient, but it's the group of patients that have PSA measurements like him. Okay, so I'm still uh, speaking about the group but now the group is much more uh, precisely defined. So this is much more relevant with the urologist, so it has less bias, but of course it will have a much greater variance because uh, we have only one patient that has these particular values of PSA in our data set. And therefore um, we are only able to identify that via uh, modeling assumptions. And, and a compromise uh, between the two would be that if we um, condition on a version of the PSA history, okay? So to say, I'm not going to consider, con condition on the specific values of PSA that I have for that particular patient, but I'm going to condition on the subgroup of patients for whom the PSA at their last visit was above a particular threshold value, okay? So therefore now, uh, I'm making the group more relevant to the urologist. So I'm saying, okay, I'm not talking about everybody, but I'm talking about the patients who have relatively high PSA levels at their last visit. Uh, but still, I'm not speaking for very, the very specific patient that I have, uh, the urologist has in front of him. So this is a kind of a compromised bias and compromised uh, variance, so in between the other effects. Okay, so... Now that I have defined this effect, of course, the next step is how um, I will need to go about to estimate uh, those. Um, and of course, uh, we know that in this context with observational data, just simply going and fitting a Cox model by including the PSA, uh, even at the time uh, varying uh, covariate, will not do uh, the correct job. So it will not uh, appropriately estimate uh, this effect. Uh, take into account uh, the challenges that we have in the data, and therefore we need more appropriate uh, methodology to achieve that. Um, and uh, of course, in the literature, there are many uh, different approaches that have been proposed to address uh, such questions. So um, there's a framework of marginal structural models with improbability of treatment weighting. Uh, we have the G formula and G estimation. Uh, we have uh, model-based approaches. Um, a, a few short uh, discussions about those. So first of all, structural marginal models uh, and G type of models uh, most often um, make uh, very uh, few assumptions for the output model. So this is their uh, main advantage. Uh, but we could uh, state as a potential disadvantage this is that they require the models for the weights to be correct. Uh, and in particular, if we have additional competing processes, like we also have uh, in our case, like uh, potentially the censoring process to be informative or the visiting process. So when the people come to give the longitudinal measurements is informative because this depends on increasing PSA. So if we have these additional competing processes, then we will need to define appropriate weight models also for these processes if we want to estimate our causal effects uh, unbiasedly. And of course, there's also doubly robust type of approaches, but again, this is an important consideration that uh, we will need to make. Now, um, on the other hand, uh, the model-based approaches uh, that estimate these effects based on an outcome model alone, um, what is their, their advantage is that um, they allow for um, additional uh, uh, competing uh, processes to depend on the longitudinal history in any uh, complex manner. So they don't require modeling these additional processes or even the salvage therapy assignment process. But of course, a disadvantage is that we will only get correct estimates for our effects if the outcome model is uh, correctly specified. And now in our uh, context, uh, and because of um, what we know in discussions that we have uh, with uh, also with urologists, also within here my uh, the Erasmus Medical Center, but also with uh, from from Michigan from the Michigan side. So we have that indeed the the salvage therapy can 
depend in a rather complex manner in the longitudinal history with different doctors deciding upon different grounds of how and when exactly to initiate salvage. So just to, uh, to say here, um, um, as, a, uh, as an example, it could be that one urologist used just the last value of the PSA to decide when to initiate salvage, whereas another urologist may decide of using the last two values and uh, computing what is called the PSA velocity. So how fast PSA is changing, and if uh, PSA changes fast, then to initiate uh, salvage. Um, and so in this kind of context, so this type of urologist uh, that deciding based on different uh, grounds of when to start the salvage therapy is a, an unknown quantity, which could be considered as a type of an instrumental variable that affects the treatment assignment. Um, and it has been uh, known that if we have these uh, interactions of confounders with instrumental variables, it can introduce a lot of bias in IPTW uh, methods. So that has been one of our motivations to opt for uh, a model-based estimation. And we are going to do that using uh, the joint models for uh, longitudinal and time to event data. Okay, so for um, people who uh, are less familiar or maybe not at all familiar with this type of models, I would like to, to use a couple of slides to intuitively introduce these models and what we're trying to do. Um, so first of all, I have this, uh, this generic uh, figure that I often use to explain the models. Uh, and what do we see in this figure? We see that on the x-axis, we have our follow-up time. And here we have the two panels, one for the, uh, for the time to event, and we have the hazard, so the risk of metastasis. And uh, in the bottom panel, we have our time varying uh, covariate, so our longitudinal outcome, in this case, the PSA. So these asterisks that you see here are the actually observed the PSA levels. Now, what uh, these models uh, try to do is that they first, uh, we specify a model for the time variant covariate. And what we are doing is that we are estimating this green line that you see here, which is the underlying trajectory, the underlying profile of PSA. And then we take this line and we uh, plug it in uh, in a Cox type of model, a proportional hazards model for the risk of our event. So here the risk of metastasis. And for instance, we say like uh, for a particular, uh, for any follow-up time T, like the one that is denoted here by this vertical line, that the level of the PSA, so the value of the green line, uh, is linked to the hazard of metastasis at the same uh, time point T. Um, now, what is the advantage of this type of models in our context is that um, these models uh, have a complete specification of the joint distribution of the PSA and the time to metastasis and the competing risk time to death. So um, in essence, the PSA is not really a covariate, but it's an outcome in these type of models. Uh, and under the key assumption of sequential ignorability, we can derive uh, valid marginal distributions and therefore uh, estimate uh, the causal effect that I introduced earlier. Uh, importantly, without requiring to model the exposure. So we don't need to model the salvage therapy uh, assignment mechanism. So and how this depends on uh, the previous uh, PSA, uh, on the history of PSA. And additionally, uh, as I mentioned uh, a minute ago, uh, this type of sequential ignorability uh, and uh, a similar assumption can be made also for uh, the ascertainment process. So if uh, uh, what I mentioned that the doctor decides to, to ask for patients to come more often because we have, uh, the, he sees an increase in their PSA trajectories. Um, uh, so again, these type of models do not require in modeling this process. So they will still provide valid uh, effect estimates without needing to model this uh, uh, visiting process. Um, okay, so... So this has been the, um, um, a general presentation of these models, but now let me go and uh, more specifically introduce for the model that we use uh, in the context of, uh, of our uh, motivating question. So um, 
again uh, to state once more that uh, as PSA increases, uh, patients may receive salvage therapy from the urologist. And we are going to denote by the SI the time a patient received this salvage therapy. And of course, it could be that for some patients, they never received salvage therapy, therefore, their uh, SI will be uh, infinite in a sense. And uh, if you recall from the figures that I have showed you in, in the very beginning, uh, that after salvage therapy, uh, what we expect to see, we expect to see a drop in the PSA levels, which may rise again um, before metastasis. Okay, so um, with all this in mind, um, uh, we defined a model of this kind for, uh, for the longitudinal PSA measurements. So our outcome is the logarithm of PSA plus one, um, and then the model has two branches. So it has one branch, which is the trajectory of the PSA before receiving salvage therapy, and then we have a second branch uh, for, the, uh, for the PSA trajectory after salvage therapy. And this second branch is the branch that uh, includes the drop that I expect to see in the PSA, and potentially a different type of uh, evolution after this uh, after this salvage therapy. So, and then um, what these models contain? Um, uh, so they contain some fixed effects. So this is the fixed effect part that describes the average overall of the patients. And here we have a second part, which is the random effect part. And it's this random effects that we include in the model that allow that these uh, green lines that I showed you here to be different from one patient to the other. Okay, so it's this part of the model that makes these models have an individualized uh, nature. And um, I have two sets of uh, fixed effects and random effects for the two branches uh, of the model. And by UI, I'm going to denote all the random effects uh, put together. So I have the B random effects before salvage, the B tilde random effects after salvage, and U is uh, all random effects together. So uh, in a picture, uh, what this model says, it says that uh, after surgery, uh, what I could potentially see for a patient is that the PSA starts increasing, and then uh, the doctor will potentially in initiate salvage, and then um, here is where I have the two branches, okay? So if the doctor does initiate salvage, then the, the, I will have the drop in PSA and potentially the PSA will remain constant or it could start increasing again for some patients. But if I did not give salvage, the PSA would potentially increase uh, rapidly and that would increase the risk of, of metastasis. Um, okay. Um, now, uh, what have been uh, the specifics uh, of the model that we use in the University of Michigan data? So uh, for the fixed effects and before salvage, we uh, allowed for a nonlinear type of profiles of, of PSA, and we did that using splines with six internal nodes. And after salvage, we allowed for the drop in the PSA levels and a change uh, in, the, in the linear evolution after uh, salvage. And we also included uh, several uh, baseline covariates in the model. So like the age, the baseline PSA, the Gleason score, the Charleston score morbidity index, the perineural invasion. Uh, and we also consider some interactions of those with um, uh, to be different before salvage and after salvage. And for the random effects, we assume the same type of uh, time effect as we did for the fixed effects part. So also in the random effects, we included the splines to allow these green lines to have a flexible shape for each individual uh, in, for each uh, individual patient. Um, now for the uh, for the event outcomes. So the time to metastasis is the primary outcome, but we have death, which have been considered as competing risks. Um, now, for the hazard for metastasis, uh, this is linked to the PSA uh, and uh, salvage therapy, and also we have uh, baseline covariates. So again, this uh, the, the model for metastasis has two branches. Uh, so it has uh, one branch uh, which describes the risk of metastasis if no salvage was given. That depends uh, on the PSA. So these are the baseline covariates. 
uh, and this is uh, uh, the PSA. And H, sorry, I forgot to mention, this is the hazard of metastasis. So the hazard of metastasis for patient I, I have baseline hazard. Here I have the effect of the baseline covariates, and here I have the effect of the PSA. Um, and then if uh, a patient did uh, receive salvage, uh, then uh, I have here uh, the salvage uh, indicator. And then here I have uh, a change in um, uh, in the in the or in the effect of PSA, okay. So we allow that the PSA is, how the PSA values uh, affect the risk of metastasis is different before salvage and after salvage with different coefficients and different what is called functional forms. So um, what is the eta t that we see here? So the eta t is the the green line. So we have the green line before metastasis and eta tilde is the green line after metastasis. And the functions F and G, they specify how which features of this green line are included into this uh, hazard model. And to explain what uh, I mean by that, so here, as I said, that F and G are the functional forms before and after salvage. Um, uh, so um, we have there different options, okay? Um, and two options that we uh, selected to use here, motivated by previous research uh, within the context of prostate cancer, uh, was the one to include not only the, the level of the PSA, so the value of the PSA, but also to include the velocity of the PSA, so how fast PSA is changing, and which is denoted by this uh, second term here, which is the slope uh, of the trajectory with respect to time. And if you would like to see that with a figure, um, this is what uh, we are assuming. So we say that the hazard of metastasis depends not only on the value of the green line, but also the slope of the green line, which is this uh, blue segment that you see here. Uh, and the second uh, functional form that we uh, consider has been the average value of the PSA up to time point T. Uh, which is denoted by the standardized area under the PSA trajectory. So this integral is the, if I want to show it again with a figure, so is the area under the PSA trajectory. And if I divide by the length uh, of, this, uh, of this time interval, that could be interpreted of what has been the average PSA in all these previous periods. Okay, so these have been the two choices that we uh, took. And for uh, the competing risk death, uh, we assume that death is not because it was from, from other causes, was not related on PSA. Uh, depends on baseline covariates. It could potentially also depend uh, on salvage. Okay, so um, I'm not going to give you um, uh, the details here, but we have fitted the model, uh, this model that I specified to the University of Michigan data. And then from that model, we can estimate the effect that I uh, introduced to you earlier. Okay, so first of all, uh, it is uh, quite straightforward to estimate the conditional effect based on the joint model, um, which is the probability of uh, having metastasis uh, within this medically uh, relevant time interval if I condition on the specific history of a particular patient I. Uh, so, this has been my, my target quantity uh, from the definition of the conditional causal effect. And I can write this down as this integral equation that you see here. And, and what this is saying very intuitively, so this last term um, um, is, uh, sorry, I forgot to mention that I have estimated the model under the Bayesian uh, approach. So this last term is the posterior of the model parameters. So theta are all the model parameters put in one vector. So here, uh, this term is the posterior of all the model parameters given the data. So this term, in a sense, accounts for the uncertainty that I have in the, in the parameters. And again, given these parameters, I have this second term which is the estimated random effects for that person given the information that I have for that patient. So, and what is the information? The information is that I know that he didn't have metastasis and he didn't die up to, D, uh, to T and he has given me some longitudinal measurements. So in a sense, what this term is doing is estimating how the green line looks like for that particular patient. 
And using this estimated green line, I put it here in the uh, first term, which is the uh, cumulative risk of metastasis within this interval. Um, so I can estimate that for, uh, by conditioning on specific patients. Um, and here, uh, how we do that uh, specifically is using a Monte Carlo scheme. So we're estimating from the posterior of the parameters. Then we're estimating the random effects from the posterior of uh, the random effects, given the information that I have. And then based on these two quantities, I estimate uh, the cumulative risk. And if I repeat this Monte Carlo scheme a number of times, then I can get an estimate of my conditional salvat therapy effect. Now, if uh, we would like to estimate the marginal effects or the marginal conditional effects that I introduced uh, in, in the beginning, what we could do is we could simply um, calculate the, the subspecific effects, so the conditional effects, and then average over the specific group of people. Okay, so uh, if I would like to calculate what is the marginal salvage therapy effect, I will calculate for all the patients who have at risk. Uh, at time t, uh, the conditional effect, and then average over all of them. So therefore, effectively, I will be averaging over all longitudinal histories of all these patients who, who are at risk at time point t, and that will be my uh, marginal uh, salvage therapy effect. Uh, and then um, here we had uh, an extra thing to state uh, a little bit uh, uh, shortly here, that to estimate the variance of this causal effect, uh, I need to take into account that they're not only a function of the parameters, but also of the data. And therefore, to do it uh, correctly, uh, we use an adaptation of procedure that has been uh, recently proposed by uh, Antonelli and Tau. So we need to be, um, as a side note, a little bit more careful how we estimate the variance of these effects. Okay, so now to show you a little bit of uh, a few results uh, with some graphs. So first of all, um, these are a couple of graphs uh, showing you uh, the fit of our postulated model for PSA to some uh, patients from the data set. Um, where uh, again, remind you zero is the time of, uh, of the prostatectomy of the surgery. And for some patients, you see this red dust line. So this red dust line denotes uh, the time of the salvat therapy, okay? Uh, where you see that for some of these patients, I have this drop on the PSA levels. And the blue line that you see here is the fitted line from our model. Okay, so where um, you can see that uh, our model had a relatively a good fit to these observed uh, PSA trajectories. And here are a few uh, other patients um, uh, uh, where uh, even though here you see uh, they had increasing uh, PSA levels, like this patient 490, and um, also many of these other patients, they did not receive salvage. Okay, so this is also illustrating that for one or another reason, uh, the doctor would not always follow the guidelines of when to initiate salvage, and it was like a, a, a big um, factor of when the salvage therapy uh, was given to this patient. Uh, now, from this particular figure that you see, I'm going to particularly focus also on these two patients, 490 and 327, because for these two, I will show you in the next slide uh, what are which we are the conditional uh, salvage therapy effects. Okay, and and these are the results. So what do we see here is that I calculated um, uh, the this salvage therapy effect at these three follow-up times, so at follow-up time 5, 9, and 13, and I calculated those for a two for the two-year time interval. So the medically relevant interval was of length uh, two years. And I did that um, uh, for the marginal effect, so when I averaged overall uh, the patients or, or overall PSA histories, I did that for the marginal conditional effect where I took only the patients for whom the last measurement of PSA was above 0 0.5. And I also have done that for these two patients that we see here. So patient 490 and patient 327. And what we see is what I described also in the very start about the bias variance trade-off that we see that the marginal effect is very, very small, but has 
very low variance because average is over all the people I have at risk at these time points. The marginal conditional effect has more uh, variability, but uh, again, it's a small effect. And we see a much bigger effect, but also with uh, more uncertainty around it uh, when I'm speaking about uh, specific patients. So here, like we see a relatively uh, larger effect for patient 490. Uh, and again, uh, now what this refers to and why I have this interval. So in a sense, I'm referring to uh, the specific subgroup of patients who have longitudinal measurements as exactly this uh, particular patient, okay? So this is a definition in a sense of my group. Uh, and not only this PSA measurements, but also his uh, baseline covariate. Okay, so uh, that brings me a little bit to the end uh, of my uh, talk. So uh, what I have presented you here is motivated by this uh, study in uh, prostate cancer patients after prostatectomy. So we have seen how we can estimate uh, conditional, um, uh, marginal and marginally conditional effects from, from joint models. Uh, just to say that these are available in uh, the JMBase 2 packets that uh, we have written within my group to estimate the joint models using uh, the PREDICT uh, function to calculate cumulative risks. And we have also a function that is currently on GitHub, is not yet on the package, but is available on GitHub called causal effect that provides all this machinery to estimate this causal effect and estimate their, uh, their variance. So all this is, uh, is uh, freely available. And yeah, I would like to, to thank you uh, for your attention. I will be glad to answer uh, any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Dimitris, for giving that uh, splendid uh, seminar. Uh, right, so if anybody has a question, uh, they could just type into the chat uh, something like question, uh, and then I'll ask you to unmute and uh, you can ask your question. Okay. Well, while you're doing that, um, I'll I'll ask a question. So, the the two regimes that were allowed were don't uh, don't don't use salvage therapy for the next two years versus use salvage therapy now. And um, I, I wondered, I, I kind of felt that. Uh, I would like to know about the effect of giving salvage therapy in six months' time or a year's time, you know, keeping your options open and then using it six months later. Um, what, what do you think of that? Um, yeah, so um, two things. So first of all, then you could define your medically relevant time interval as the time of the next um visit, as you said, six months, because um, typically every six months, uh, the doctor will ask for the next PSA measurement. Uh, and then you could make your delta T shorter instead of two years. So this is also a, a choice that needs to be made. But uh, what we are trying to, to mimic here is um, again, with some discussions that we had with, with the urologists is that they typically want to decide at the moment that they see, uh, they see the, um, the patient. Okay, so in this case, should we start now or should we wait? Uh, and I think what you are um, addressing here is how long should we wait? Okay, so should we wait six months or should we wait two years? So this is certainly a consideration, but this, as I mentioned, can be adjusted by this delta T. But suppose, mainly, sorry, yeah, I, I, yeah, sorry, carry on, yeah. Carry on. Well, I suppose, yeah, I, yeah, I suppose what I had in mind was you you might be interested in um, the effect on survival for ten years, but you want to, you don't want to have just two regimes possible, which are start now or wait 10 years? Um, yes. So, I mean, uh, in essence, um, I think that this should be possible to be calculated based on what uh, we have uh, worked here. So, because you could say that, that the salvage could be initiated at some uh, future time point. But then, then the question is, um, again, 
how exactly will be uh, the definition of that. So it could be like a little bit ad hoc or because typically that will depend on the PSA levels. So that every time, in a sense, um, th this type of decision uh, process uh, was like kind of more sequential that every time the, um, the uh, yeah the patient comes back so we have a new PSA measurement available and the the urologist asks the question again should we now give salvage or we should wait um, and so because we had this uh, sequential decision process uh, into consideration this is why we define it like that so that the decision time is now and not what to do in six months time, because then in six months time, I will have a new measurement coming along and therefore this may change things. But in other contexts could be um, could be formulated like that. Because you could specify a, a decision rule like uh, start salvage therapy if the PSA is increasing at such and such a rate. And then uh, I think you'd be able to uh, with yeah. such a decision rule, you'd be able to work out what the probability of still being alive in 10 years is if that yes, decision yes. rule is applied every, say, six months or something like that. Oh, yeah, that, uh, yeah, that could, could be possible, yes. Uh, so, da Daniel, Daniel, uh, if you'd like to, uh, if you can unmute yourself. Hi, hi. Um, thanks for a great talk. Um, I had a question about the assumptions of the model. Um, so as I understand it, it may be the case that PSA is raised because of metastasis, so that it kind of is a raised PSA might be might kind of come after metastasis in a causal chain. Does the model uh, assume that that's not the case, or is that kind of um, consistent with the modeling assumption? Well, um yeah first of all i'm i'm not that much into the biology of things but as far as my understanding goes is that as some first metastatic cells will start appearing that will trigger psa increase but perhaps this metastasis is no longer substantive there and this is why uh, the urologists monitor the psa okay so that as more metastatic cells start to uh, multiply that will drive a PSA increase. But maybe it's not enough because, I mean, uh, how they really find it is using a biopsies. Uh, and uh, of course, maybe it's not enough still to find it or big enough to find it in a biopsy. And this is why they monitor the PSA. And this is why what, what they first say also, uh, um, uh, if the PSA increases up to different types of thresholds or different guidelines, they say that they have a biochemical recurrence so based on the blood value, but the actual metastasis is when they find um, in the biopsy. Thanks. Oh, Jessica, Jessica, go ahead. Thank you, Sean. Am I, uh, can you hear me? We can hear yes. you. Yeah. Um, thank you, Demetrius. I really enjoyed your talk. Um, thank you. So I had a question. Um, so at a point you said that uh, that using the, this kind of joint modeling methods meant that you didn't need to do the inverse probability of weighting. Mm -hmm. um, because I guess, so, so normally if there's a selection bias, you might do a, a inverse probability of weighting to, to kind of even out those selection biases. So what is it about the joint model that means you don't need to do that? Um, yeah, so um, uh, in essence, you don't need to do that because I think I have a couple of slides. Maybe I don't remember if I have in this presentation. Uh, yeah, I have it here. So, um, so what what do we see here? So this is the full posterior under the joint model. Okay. So mm -hmm. what, what what is theta? Theta are the parameters of the joint model. U are the random effects and theta n uh, are the parameters for the exposure model. So the salva therapy assigning model. So this is a model that you will do in a, a, in a inverse probability weighting. Okay, so this type of yeah. logistic regression, you could say. 
Um, now, under the sequential ignorability, uh, what it turns out is that you can factorize this full posterior in having two components. So one component being your join model here with the theta parameters uh, and here the, uh, the random effect. And here you have the second component, which says, what is the chance of giving you um, uh, Salvat now, given your history of PSA, given what I have done up to now for Salvat that I didn't give you. And here are um, uh, all the, the parameters of that model and the random effects. So under sequence and ignorability, we have that this depends only on the history and does not depend on the random effects. And because is that, then this term will not carry any information for the theta and the u. So therefore, you can only base the estimation of the joint model using the first term, and you can ignore the second term. Um, just to say something extra here, so this is something, um, uh, this is in essence the same thing that we have under the missing at random assumption. Okay, so we say when we have missing data, why we call that an ignorable missingness mechanism if we use a likelihood-based approach is that you still have here, in essence, here you have your measurement model and here you have your missingness process, but because the missingness process depends on what you have observed, then um, this factorizes out of the likelihood and you can base inference for the measurement model by ignoring uh, the missingness process. So um, uh, the sequential ignorability in essence buys you exactly the same thing. That you can ignore the second term and then focus only on the first term. However, as it is also the case for the missing at random is that you only have that if your measurement model, your outcome model is correctly specified. Yeah. But I in see. essence, this is, this is the, uh, this is the, um, the essence of it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And and just to say something additional that this type of logic, uh, and, and this is the, the advantage of using a model-based approach carries over to other competing processes that you may have. So here is like the um, the model for the exposure for salva therapy, but you can imagine that you have another process could be the censoring process, that the censoring could depend on the history of PSA, or you have the visiting process, which says that the, when people come back to give me the next PSA measurement depends on the history of PSA. And again, if you can make similar kind of um, uh, this type of assumption that it only depends on the history, but don't depends on the random effect, does not depend on the current value, then these additional processes, they also factorize out of the likelihood and your join model will still give you uh, valid uh, effect estimates, even if you ignore these additional processes. Whereas if you would work uh, more with a kind of a structural marginal model, uh, you will need inverse probability of weighting also for censoring and also for the ascertainment process to get you a correct estimate. But right, of course, then, yeah. Okay, uh, so I think in that case, um, it's one o'clock, so I think we'll tie it up there. Um, thank you very much again, Demetris. Um, thank you very much. Uh, stay on the line, Demetris. Uh, you know why. Uh, yeah, but I'll, I'll stop, re stop recording now. And uh, goodbye, everyone. Thanks for coming. Bye-bye. Thank you for the invitation.